going to demonstrate their best selves under great pressure, but in the right home that doesn't pressure them, it's like you said, you're not, you know, comfortable with snakes. So if I test Sally Morgan in a room full of boas, I should not be surprised that I may see the very worst version of Sally Morgan. Yeah, that SAT score would be so low. <laughs> and if I if I put you in a in a home situation where you don't have to deal with snakes, um, I will see a different version of Sally. Not that one is false, the other isn't. One is you under great pressure, and one is you in an environment that suits you. So this is one of the challenges that we always have when we're looking at at temperament and assessment. So that's. I think fat can help us understand how functional is this animal. Because if he's telling us in its function, this environment has me distressed, right, and I am stressed by this and I'm struggling to cope with just where I'm living, then I have to be very careful taking the results of any test seriously. If the animal says, no, I'm good, I don't like it, you know, but I'm, I'm good, it's kind of like airport delays, right, and your, your plane will be delayed for 14 hours. It's such a test of temperament to see what people do. Um, it's just entertaining. I've I've had to watch that experiment played out many times now oh, yeah. <laughs> in my life. <laughs> I think there's the ultimate temperament test right there, airports. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, or heavy traffic. <laughs> exactly. What do you do? Mm, shrug and put another book in Audible, uh, you know, call a friend or fume and, and work yourself into a, a lather. It says something about who you are and how you handle that kind of stress. And, well, I love we that we can use your uh, tool. To Pardon mm-hmm. me. I love that we can use your tool with, um, you know, for instance, dogs being used with in therapy settings or animal assisted therapy and shelters. Because I think so many animals that are being used, uh, and, and horses in particular at this point in time, um, in these settings are not always very well understood by the people working with them. And this tool is just wonderful for that. I, I think the, there's going to be a growing tend, tendency. We, we've put dogs into the service of mankind. We've done the same with horses. Many of the people I've met and worked with in those fields, they mean well, but they are not expert animal husbands by any means, and they're sometimes so taken with the the humane notion of what they're doing for the people that the animal's needs are, are badly overlooked. There's, there's one horse therapy organization. They were in, in their materials, they're talking about selecting a horse for this kind of work, and they said temperament didn't really matter. It was okay even if they were a little aggressive because some clients might need that. And I no. thought, oh, my God, if, if we write, you know, human counselor, <laughs> it's like it doesn't really matter. You know, well, how else can that horse tell you he has something going on than to raise the <laughs> vibration of his experience? And if we push him, he's going to start getting dangerous. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a need to understand first however well we intend the work, that the animal will have his own individual capacity to, to bear the situation. So I used to do therapy work with, with um, a bunch of my dogs, and two of them loved going to the nursing home. Loved it. I mean, they, they, they were really just delighted. I could probably get to turn them loose, uh, other than they would have jumped in bed with people. But two of my other dogs found the nursing home unbelievably depressing. They, they could do maybe 15 minutes, and then every time we were anywhere near an exit, they were hopeful that we were actually going to be leaving. Oh, boy. <laughs> they were very agreeable. They were very good dogs with great temperament, so I could insist. Um, but it began to dawn on me. These, these guys came home, and they slept really hard. It had taken a lot out of them. The other dogs napped on the way home and were, were perfectly fine. But the two Well, dogs- that brings us to the idea of stress in dogs, and how do mm. people... You know, with even a, a horse in a therapeutic situation or your dog in your own home, can you give us some pointers about how to recognize stress in our dogs? I know there's a therapy dog group around here, and a guy is training with the group, and he said, oh, look at him. He rolls over. He just loves belly rubs before he even greets the person. And I'm like, that's not necessarily a good thing. Right. So rolling over on your back and asking for belly rub made to an uneducated eye look the same as a dog who says, please stop, I can't take any more. They look very, very different um, to the knowledgeable eye. So one of the things we have to keep asking when we're looking at stress in a situation where we're putting dogs to work for us, right? 
therapy dogs, support dogs. Is, first of all, is there voluntary cooperation? Is, is this dog actually free or this horse free to leave and walk away? Or are they free to tell us no thank you? And are we keeping a careful eye to the, the more natural rhythms of interaction that animals have versus the, the long, sustained um, human approach, which is this is the problem we have, so I'm going to stay here till it's done. Um, that's just not how animals tend to deal with interactions. So they get forced into interactions, and then they start telling their person, I, I really don't want to be doing this. And it might be that they're as simple as their gait slows down a bit. It might be that they turn their head, and it's a very polite way of saying, please. Where's the door? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, we can scold them. So I, I just tell people, like, are you aware of having to keep that animal in that space? Um, are they relaxed? How, how does this compare to how they look in your living room? You know, is this animal free to go? If you were to take that leash off, if you were to unsnap from that halter, where would they go? I'm not recommending you do that in a nursing home. <laughs> just <No>. saying <laughs> it's a question because almost always the handler actually knows what the answer would be, which is, well, he'd leave. It's like, Right. So there's a wonderful book called Teaming with Your Therapy Dog by Ann Howie, uh, H-O-W-I-E. And that one, I think, should be on the shelf of anyone who is using any animal in any therapeutic setting because she has really carefully outlined what the handler's responsibilities are and, and the, the rights and freedoms that the, the therapy animal has as well. And while it's written about dogs, that's her expertise, it is uh, equally applicable to any animal that you're going to put into someone's hands. So you'll, you'll see this on the national news. There's been a huge crisis, and there's dogs that get you know, brought to the scene to help comfort everyone. And on paper, that is an amazing and wonderful thing. And if I'm ever in some horrible tragedy, I hope to God they bring me a dog. Or <laughs> but I would also hope that they brought me a dog or a horse who actually was okay being there. Yeah, when I brought my dogs to New York City after 9-11, I got a lot of compliments from people because my dogs weren't stressed, and a lot of the search dogs in particular uh, were very stressed. They couldn't find things, and they were, you know, working days and days, and it was a horrible environment. But I know part of why my dogs were happy was because they went to go walk around the park at night and they had chicken and they had me doing tea touch on them and it was really like I was meeting every single one of their possible needs in every minute that they weren't working and so they were happy and you know they just have a temperament that they like to do that work. Exactly. Which brings me to my next question Suzanne, can you tell us some of the things you see as the real benefits of having a relationship with your dog instead of just having a good dog that you've trained? I think the, the, the thing that people tell me over and over again is, number one, they're, they're blown away by the, the level of communication, mm. that they just didn't know this depth of relationship was possible in an animal. Um, when, there's, when there's mutual respect and trust and cooperation, there's a, a lightness. There's, there's a real joyfulness of, of happening and a, and a lack of conflict. And so many people have had animals that were either, you know, either not well suited to their lifestyle or, or not well suited to the sport they were asking them. And so there was, there was always this resistance, this, this conflict, this, this argument between horse and rider or dog and handler. And when they get it right, that all just evaporates. And it, it blows people's minds because, number one, it feels amazing to have right. an animal who freely says, sure, you know, what's up? What, what are we doing? So that's, that's the most charming question of all in a relationship, right? It's right. Not, this is what I want to do. It's like, hey, how about we? Um, yeah, so the we thing is, is absolutely huge. That's why we created that CCC course, was to give people a, a, a simple and fun way to experience what that kind of cooperation and mutual respect looks like and to clarify the communication um, and, and that's what people say like I had no idea I thought I had a good relationship 
until I started really listening to the dog, really engaging and working with them in a way that made sense to them. Um, right. And they're like, this is a whole nother level. It's like, you know, I always said my, my old history teacher in high school, he had dancing class. We all had to take dancing. He was a spectacular dancer. So after dancing with the clods, you know, my, my classmates, then Mr. Um, Kreider took over. I was like, oh, <laughs> Oh, that's how it's supposed to feel. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. I, I can see why people like to dance. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I think it's so important, um, the work that you're doing, to help people find that lightness and joy in their relationship with their dogs. It's such a, um, we've come such a long way in dog training in the last 20 years, and I think we have um, quite a ways to go to get to the side where you are already. It's been my pleasure to have you with us today. Um, you can find out more about Suzanne Clothier on her website, SuzanneClothier.com. That's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-C-L-O-T-H-I-E-R.com. And you can find her on her Facebook page where she has over 12,000 followers and she has just wonderful stuff there. Um, and until next week, thanks so much for listening to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets with your host today, Sally Morgan, holistic physical therapist, and Dr. Judy's sister on DreamVision7Radio.com. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Sally, for having me. That's all for today. Find more answers to your questions next time on Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets every Monday and Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Time by going to DreamVision7Radio.com. Join holistic veterinarian Dr. Judy to discover healthy options for raising your pets in a more holistic manner. Visit DrJudyMorgan.com to learn more. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow.